morning, everybody. Good morning. Welcome here to worship at Temple United Methodist Church. It's nice to see you all. Uh, praise the Lord. We ran out of bulletins this morning. It's always a good problem to have. Uh, so if you are comfortable sharing with your seatmate, uh, you can make a bulletin available and to someone who doesn't have one. Um, I, think, I think we're good as of right now. Oh, and by the way, the, the sirens that you've been hearing, that's Santa Claus. No need to be alarmed unless you're scared of Santa, in which case he's staying outside as far as I know. Sounds like they're coming back. Here they come. Santa Claus is coming to town. All right, this morning we are going to share and worship together, and we have uh, some friends with us joining us. Thank you for joining us. Uh, and being with us this morning, our temple singers are going to share uh, a couple of our lunch bunches founder, Ruth Klein. Uh, we invite Shankle and temple congregations to join us. We will begin our program in the church sanctuary, that's Shankle United Church of Christ Sanctuary, followed by cookies, punch, and coffee in the social room. Take an hour or two break from your busy Christmas preparations and celebrate the season with us lunch bunch style. That takes place at 1 p.m. today at Shankill United Church of Christ, with Christ, which is down the street and around the corner uh, from us. The final lunch bunch event. Uh, December 20th, that's this Tuesday, we will have Bible study here at Temple United Methodist Church, weather and illness permitting. Uh, December 21st, that's this Wednesday, is the longest night service at Shankill UCC at 7 p.m. That will be led by Pastor Suzanne from Shankill and me. Uh, we will be doing that service together. The longest night service takes place on the longest <laughs> night of the year. And uh, it recognizes that the holidays, while it's a joyous time for most people, are really not a joyous time uh, for some people. And this service is for those people. Um, it's a more quiet, contemplative, meditative service, a lot of prayer. Um, and any and all of you are welcome to join us for that, whether it's been a difficult year for you or not. Uh, but that is the longest night service at Schenkel at 7 p.m. on Wednesday. And we will be here in the sanctuary on Christmas Eve, 7 p.m. for our candlelight service, just like we used to know. <laughs> just like the ones we used to know. Uh, Christmas Eve, 7 p.m. right here. I hope you'll be here, too. And then Christmas Day is a Sunday this year, so we will be here at 10.30 a.m. here in the sanctuary on Christmas Day. hope you'll join us for that. Uh, a little bit later in January, we have our final like celebration and uh, sharing session for our Bible readers. Uh, all of those details are in your bulletin. There are, other, there are several other announcements in your bulletin, including how you can support our Columbia mission trip and the three missionaries from Temple who will be joining in that trip, John, Kim, and Anna McGrath. Uh, so you can read all about that under the uh, du duly noted section of your bulletin. Do we have any additional announcements for this morning? All right, then let's continue in our worship with a moment for reflection. <laughs>
This time I invite you to join in the singing of our opening hymn, which today is number 238 in your hymnals, Angels We Have Heard on High. And if you're joining us online, welcome, and you will find those words printed in your bulletin. join me also in our opening prayer for this morning, which you will find printed in your book. Let's pray together. Loving God, we open ourselves to you this Christmas season. As these candles shine with earthly light, brighten our lives with the light of your love. Magnify that love in us and through us. Transform our hearts that we may walk in the light of Christ. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. Thank you. 
Our first scripture reading for this morning comes from Isaiah chapter 7, verses 10 through 16. Again, the Lord spoke to Ahaz, saying, Ask a sign of the Lord your God, that it be deep as Sheol, or high as heaven. But Ahaz said, I will not ask, and I will not put the Lord to the test. Then Isaiah said, Hear then, O house of David, is it too little for you, to weary mortals, that you weary my God also? Therefore the Lord himself will give you a sign. Look, the young woman is with child, and shall bear a son, and his name shall be Emmanuel. He shall eat curds and honey by the time he knows how to refuse the evil and choose the good. For before the child knows how to refuse the evil and choose the good, the land before whose two kings you are in dread will be deserted. For the uh, weeks of Advent, the four weeks of Advent, we have, um, well, we have, as we always have, decorated our sanctuary. Uh, but this year we did something a little different, and uh, in each window you will see a unique um, <coughs> setup, uh, a decoration uh, featuring an arbor vitae and some other decorations and, and different people uh, and their families from our church have decorated each one of them. And during worship, each week during Advent, we have been uh, sharing, uh, the, the people who decorated those windows have been, have been sharing uh, their decorations with us and the, the meaning behind them. And today we have the final two uh, windows for this year. And uh, I guess I'm going to start with Sue Malloy. Oh, okay. Oh, oh, mine is the window there, but now you have to go up and look at later. Mm -hmm. And uh, the decorations are basically a reflection of my love of glass, leaded glass, colored glass. Um, they're all angels that I've picked up recently from thrift stores, and they're all, uh, most of them are with musical instruments making a joyful noise um, to celebrate the birth of Jesus. So, yeah. They're lovely. Normally they would be in my kitchen window so that I get the light coming through. How many more do you have at home? Pardon me? How many more do you have at home? I kept most of the blue ones at home. I do have about maybe 10 Because more. when we collect, sometimes we have these amazing. <laughs> yeah, maybe 10 more. But well, yeah, they're, they're very beautiful. Thank you for sharing. <laughs> they are. They are beautiful. Thank you, Sue, for that display. And the other window we're going to hear about this morning is, most of you cannot see it, but it is really great. It's the, the one up here next to the Christmas tree, and uh, it was done by Teresa and Henry Yorgi. I'm ready to share about that now. Thank you. No, the sheep. <laughs> <laughs> it's one of those mornings, as it's always. Uh, Teresa wrote a couple of things for me to read. I hope I can read it adequately. Um, she's always been a big fan of angels, and I guess if I buy an angel for Christmas, I'm always on the good list. And if I don't get an angel, I get on the naughty list. So uh, we do have a collection. And uh, how many are at home yet? A few. <laughs> Sometimes when we collect things, like people used to collect the Hummels, they have thousands of them or something. <laughs> We do enjoy the angels welcome our tree and the ones that sit around. One of my favorite images of Christmas is that of the heavenly host and angels announcing the birth of the Christ child. We have quite a collection of angels in our home, and the angels in our window are just a few of them. The holy scriptures, the writing of the saints, and the experience of Christians for over 2,000 years demonstrate the countless ways that holy angels watch over our lives, <coughs> protecting and guiding the faithful the church and the nations of the world. They are mighty, glorious, and ever loyal to one true King, Jesus Christ. The angels are sent to protect us when we're going through life, to awaken our conscience, and keep us focused on the glory and majesty of God. 
All right, I invite you to take a few uh, minutes after the service is over today to, to take a look at all the windows and particularly the two that we heard about this morning. Thank you, Henry, uh, for sharing that with us. And thank you to Teresa uh, for uh, writing that piece that you so eloquently shared. We continue now in the worship service with the reading this morning of the gospel according to Matthew we're going to hear chapter 1 verses 18 through 25. Now the birth of Jesus the Messiah took place in this way. When his mother Mary had been engaged to Joseph but before they lived together she was found to be with child from the Holy Spirit. Her husband Joseph being a righteous man and unwilling to expose her to public disgrace planned to dismiss her quietly. But just when he had resolved to do this, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream and said, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary as your wife, for the child conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will bear a son, and you are to name him Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. All this took place to fulfill what had been spoken by the Lord through the prophet. Look, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and they shall call him Emmanuel, which means God with us. When Joseph awoke from sleep, he did as the angel of the Lord commanded him. He took her as his wife, but had no marital relations with her until she had born a son. And he named him
Maybe it's just me, but I think that Joseph is one of the most underrated characters in the entire Bible. We don't hear much about him, and we hear nothing from him. His story would have been untold if not for Matthew, who chose to include that story in his gospel. Luke does speak of Joseph, but we, we get only a few mentions of his name. In Luke's gospel. Luke's Joseph makes no decisions. He, he simply does as our well-known Christmas story dictates. Matthew's Joseph, though, well, he utters not a single word, but he makes decisions. He takes action and influences the course of events. He is significant. Yet I don't hear him getting too, man, too much credit for any of that. How many sermons about Joseph have you heard? Although I, I think if he were allowed to express his opinion on the relatively little space he gets in the story, I think Joseph would say that he's fine with that. Given the decisions that we see him make in Matthew's narrative, Joseph might actually say that he's in it too much already. It wouldn't surprise me to learn that Joseph is very happy to be the most underrated biblical character. I know several underrated people, and none of them seem to strive for higher ratings. The underrated people I know just do what they need to do to serve whatever purpose they have been called to serve. And like Joseph, they're mostly fine. I was present recently at a local event. Now, I thought it was going to be a, a small, kind of a low-key thing, with, you know, a few people gathering to engage in this event. But as it turned out, this, this sporting event, this athletic competition was kind of a big deal. Like hundreds of people were there. I did not expect this. There were lots of activities. There were fitness companies uh, talking about their products and leading the uh, athletes in warm-ups and things. There was a photo booth, food vendors, an event staff of several dozen people were there to provide help for the competitors. Local police and EMS personnel were there in case of emergency. People were helping with parking and wayfinding. There was a lot of stuff happening. I was kind of blown away because I work fairly closely with the person who organized this event. I had no idea it was so big and involved and did and involved so many people and so much coordination and one person coordinated the entire thing. They had a lot of help. But one person. 
coordinated the entire thing. This person didn't have much of an active role on the day of the event, though. They weren't on the microphone leading everyone and emceeing a, a, the event, although someone they recruited did serve as MC and was very engaging. This person was present at the event and they helped to distribute the prizes for the people who were, you know, uh, the top competitors in the different divisions, but they didn't say anything. They chose not to make themselves the story. Truth be told, you could have attended and even participated. Maybe, maybe you would have competed in the event. You could have been one of the competitors without knowing that the person who organized everything, without whom this event would not have happened at all, was walking around, taking a few pictures, having conversations with people, but generally not being seen or heard. You might have talked with this person on the day of the event without knowing that they're the ones who coordinated the whole thing. And that is the way this person, whom I have not named, because I think they would be mortified if I did, that is the way this person wanted it. The person who organized the event I attended simply did what they did in order to serve the purpose they were called to serve. And he, or she, was fine with that. That is what underrated people do. Not everyone is appointed to be an underrated presence. Some are called to be known because that may be the way they serve the purpose they are called to serve. A president of a nation does not serve his or her nation by being an unseen presence. I'm not sure someone who prefers to be an unseen presence would ever get elected president. Come to think of it, they probably wouldn't run in the first place. Emergency personnel do not serve their purpose by being unseen. In an emergency, they are the only people we really want to see. We don't want to see the event organizer on a mic saying, hey, we have an emergency. We want to see the emergency personnel. We don't want them to be unseen. For some, their purpose requires them to be seen. But let's consider Joseph, who could have chosen to make his presence known, who could have grasped significance, who could have served <coughs> his purpose in that way, but chose not to. The one line in our passage from this morning that brings Joseph, Joseph's underratedness into focus for me every year, every year is this verse. Number nine, Mary's husband, Joseph, being a righteous man and unwilling to expose her to public disgrace, planned to dismiss her quietly. Mary was unwed. I know Matthew says husband, but they were not yet married. And despite the fact that they hadn't consecrated their marriage yet, Mary was also pregnant. There would be only one conclusion possible in such a circumstance. Mary was an adulteress. As such, according to the law of Moses, she should be stoned to death. In order to avoid this, Joseph made the decision to call off the wedding, but to do it quietly so that Mary could be spared public disgrace and probably a death sentence. And obviously, this also saved the life of their unborn child, uh, the, well, uh, the unborn child that Mary was carrying. Joseph did not have to do this. He did not have to do it this way. He could have satisfied the righteous requirements of the law in another less humane, less compassionate, and less gracious, legally appropriate way. He probably would have been congratulated for doing so, too. As we all know, the angel in a dream told Joseph to do something else entirely, which required Joseph to swallow even more of any pride he may have had. He was urged to go along with the wedding, even though the child wasn't technically his. When called to serve a larger purpose, Joseph chose to do so at the expense of his own possible role in the events that were taking place around him. And he continued to do this even after the birth of Jesus. 
In Matthew, Joseph is constantly being asked to quietly and humbly serve the larger purpose of safely shepherding Jesus into this world. Joseph's decisions went unheralded at the time, but that doesn't mean they weren't absolutely pivotal. Human beings tend to be drawn more to those whose names are known, whose presence is visible. Our role models tend to be popular or famous. Our heroes are those great people of history whose purposes were clear and common knowledge. Some of us may even aspire to that sort of life, a life of significance and purpose that brings positive change to the world in a visible way. And you know, maybe brings us some notoriety too. That'd be okay. Yet most of us, that is to say, most real people, have a role that is like that of Joseph. Most of us will be called to a role in the story of Jesus that will never bring us popularity or, or fame or even local notoriety. Most of us will be underrated. We will be more effective, more significant than anybody will ever know. Well, anybody except the Lord. The Lord will know. Underrated people like you and I simply do what they need to do to serve the purpose they were called to serve. Your role in the story might not make you famous, but that doesn't mean it is not absolutely pivotal. You have been called to have a hand in realizing the kingdom of God here in this life. And to be a citizen of that kingdom in the next, there is no, indeed, there never will be a higher purpose than that. Let's pray. God, you... You well know my underrated friend, David Shermer. And you know what he always used to say. Everybody wants to be somebody famous, but who's going to drive the bus? Well, I'd remind us that it is the, it is the underrated people, the people who serve without notoriety, who quietly do what needs to be done according to the purpose they are called to. Help us to remember that is, it is the underrated people who make most of the history of faith and indeed the world happen. citizens of the kingdom who go about their kingdom business, their kingdom mission, and their kingdom calling without seeking significance or fame, just quietly being faithful to you. And if you should call some of us, one of us, two of us here, to some greater role then so be it, and may we faithfully discharge the purpose for which you have called us. But for most of us, you have called us to a life of quiet faithfulness, of being peacemakers, of being faith restorers, of bringing life where maybe there is a shortage of life, of realizing the kingdom of God even in this Thank you for that mission. We pray that we would be faithful to it, whether we get noticed or not.
we've heard God's word read and proclaimed today, I'd like to invite us now to join in bringing our good confession before the Lord. Our prayer of confession is printed as a response to prayer in your bulletin. I invite you to turn there at this time. When our spirits despair and we deny our blessedness, forgive us, O oh God. When we ignore the mighty things you have done, when we doubt your mercy, forgive us, O oh God. When we are proud in the thoughts of our hearts, when our power rests in the oppression of others, when our wealth causes others to go hungry, forgive us, O oh God. Now I invite us each to take a few moments in the quiet of our hearts to address our prayers to God. My friends, hear these words of assurance. God, in remembrance of mercy, has fulfilled the promise God made to his children forever. The mighty one, Jesus, has done great things for us. Thanks be to God, we are forgiven. Amen. And at this time, I'd like to invite our ushers to come forward so that we may share in offering our gift. God, we do indeed thank you for all the good gifts that you have given to us, especially for the gift of your Son, the Lord Jesus Christ, who was born to us at Christmas time. We pray, God, that you would take and use us and use the gifts that we have returned to you this morning to bring about your kingdom in this world. For we pray it in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ, and all God's people said, Amen. Amen. And you may be seated. Thank you. 
Virginia. So we are going to be praying for uh, safe travel for all Wilsons and <coughs> a blessed house full of rejoicing <laughs> as you celebrate the holiday together. Um, and also Marsha Peterman, um, a very skilled soprano. Thank you very much for adding your talents to our musical offering this morning. Ask for prayer for her entire family. Thank you all for being here with us today. Do I have any other joys or concerns? Barbara. Uh, yes, today is also the first day of the Jewish Hanukkah. Mm -hmm. And uh, I'm from lower New York State, uh, which has a very high Jewish population. Mm -hmm. And uh, when I was in high school, I was, uh, I heard about a babysitting job after school, and it that was with a Jewish family. And when I came to the door, a little boy answered the door. He said, Mommy is cleaning the floor. This was on a Friday when I would be there, be going there every Friday. So when I came, she had her arm in a cast. Oh. She had broken her arm, and here she is trying to do the floor with a broken arm. And I said, you could say, I, I know how to do that. I'd be glad to do the floor for you, and you can sit and read with your children if you'd like. So uh, she was so grateful, and uh, it was so I got to be good friends with the family. She showed me how she did a, a kosher kitchen, mm. and it was interesting. And a couple of times I went to their services. Uh, they called the church, what was it called, church the shul? Uh, shul. Mm -hmm. Men all wore the little flat caps, mm. and uh, I would go with them. So um, I, my request is prayers for a joyous Hanukkah for our Jewish family. I work with a couple of people who are uh, of the Jewish faith, and they will join me in prayer for Hanukkah for them. So we will pray for that. Thank you, Barbara. Do we have any other joys or concerns, Sue? Other joys, Linda. Uh, a couple of things. Uh, I've been told to announce a pick up your Christmas cards over in the attic. Okay. Uh, but the other thing, my husband is in the hospital. He had his surgery Thursday. He's doing as well as can be expected. He should be in ICU for at least another five days, and then five days of rehab after that. Um, and he's hurting a little. Yeah. <laughs> but the doctor says he's doing remarkably well. Yeah. We will pray for Ralph. Uh, please continue to pray for Ralph. Yes.
second marriage to Brother Charlie Mitchell. Um, she's in nowhere west of Wilkes-Barre. I mean, it's oh. remote. Um, he, her husband's name was the only name on the deed to the house. Oh, no. So she is in a home she can't afford to live in. The stepson is has no urgency to settle the estate. Um, she's remote. She's isolated from her daughters who are in this area, Douglasville and Lansdale. Um, she's depressed. Mm -hmm. She is really struggling with not being able to take a step forward until that house gets sold. He left her, her, her husband left her in a financial mess. Mm -hmm. So it's, <laughs> she's still ignoring, but she's angry. She's dealing with a lot of issues and she is depressed. Other joys and concerns. Susan. Um, James had COVID this past week. Uh, he said it was not funny at all, very well, um, for three days. Then it started getting better. So, um, so he's, he's improving. So. Good. And um, we went to Washington on my birthday oh. to go to the White House. It took Kristen four months to get an appointment to go to the White House. And the weather uh, was really bad. So we walked around Washington in the rain and um, they closed the White House because of the weather. Oh, no. <laughs> so we went to the Capitol and the Smithsonian and we still had a good time, we were all together and they rescheduled the White House tour for Saturday. So we went home Thursday night and Anthony brought us back down on Saturday. Really? Yeah. So we toured, we toured the White House and uh, it was beautiful, it was absolutely gorgeous. And uh, we were we went in on one floor and then had to go to another floor and there was like a huge staircase. And I said, oh, that's a lot of stairs. <laughs> and I had trouble with stairs. So the security police was everywhere. And I said, is that the only way up? And he says, well, there is an elevator, but you have to walk a while to get to it. And I looked at the stairs. I I'm going to walk, but I didn't want to do the stairs. So Carson and I went this other way to get to the elevator. So we went through the White House kitchen to get there. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so I got my own special tour. So that was yeah. good. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, but we had a good time. Thanks, thanks for the tip, honey. I'm glad that you got to do that. I'm glad you got to see the White House. That's yeah, good. Other joys or concerns? Kim? I have a joy for the piano and keeping him quiet. <laughs> <laughs> Me too. All right, then let's go before the Lord in prayer. God, we, your people, are celebrating in this season. And we know that the birth of Jesus probably didn't actually take place in uh, the winter months. Uh, but that is when we celebrate it, and, and we uh, enjoy the celebration of that. We are not the only ones celebrating, and we thank you for the reminder uh, that your original and chosen people, uh, Jewish, the Jewish faith, are celebrating Hanukkah beginning today. And they are not the only ones celebrating in addition to us. There are others who are celebrating different events at this time of year. And God, the, the beginning or the late fall, very late fall and early winter is chock full of Celebrations. We pray, God, that uh, whoever is celebrating uh, at this time uh, would have a house full of joy uh, and a welcome celebration, maybe a welcome diversion from 
the everyday circumstances um, of their lives, as good or bad as they may be. We pray for all celebrations at this time, God, that you would bless them all. And we thank you for the celebration of Kevin and Elena and their upcoming wedding. We thank you, God, for uh, the joy that was uh, so evident uh, in that celebration. And we pray that you would bless that couple as they prepare uh, to join in marriage. And we thank you for Ruthie and her family and their visit to the White House, which had to be put off briefly, but did actually get to happen, and we pray, God, we thank you, God, for the working out of that timing, and whatever hand you had in that. Uh, we thank you, especially for Anthony, who was willing to drive them back down to Washington, D.C., so they could make that visit. We just thank you for uh, all of that that went together to, to make that happen. <coughs> and God, we give you thanks for music, and for the gift of being able to make it. Today, we're, today we are praying for those who can play the piano, which is a very difficult instrument to play, and I do so share with him in appreciating those who have the gift of being able to make music with a keyboard. And thank you, God, for the gift of music generally and for piano players in particular. Thank you for joy who graces us with excellent music every single week. Thank you, God, for all that you are doing and do for your people through music. God, we continue to, or we pray, we lift up Marsha and her entire family. We thank you that so many of them are joining with us here in worship today. We pray that a blessing upon Marsha and her entire family in this season uh, in the days to come. And we thank you for the Wilsons and their extended family who are all getting together uh, this week, so many of them, I think the number Liz gave us last week was 35. Um, we just pray, God, for safe travel for every single one of those people and for just a, a ter tremendous uh, celebration uh, of the Christmas holiday as they get together. Uh, and lots of them, uh, may, well, looks like all of them are going to be traveling across state lines to get there. A lot of people are going to be doing the same in this week, in the next couple of weeks, we pray, God, for safety. We pray for wisdom as people uh, head out on the roads or uh, take a flight or whatever they do, God, that they would be smart in the way uh, that they handle themselves and other people on the roads uh, and in the airways. God, we lift to you, Lisa Yoakum. We thank you that she is doing well, but. Uh, it sounds like she's experiencing some issues with uh, the continuing care in her, in her home. Um, I don't know if that's personnel issues or scheduling issues or whatever it is. God, you know the issues, and you are already at work. And we pray that you would quickly resolve those issues so Lisa can just uh, live life as she would like to live it and receive the care that uh, she needs to receive. We pray the same for Ralph uh, in ICU for the next several days. We pray, God, that you would be with him, that you would lift his spirits. Uh, Linda says he's hurting a little bit. That's to be expected after open-heart surgery. And we just pray, God, that that surgery, it sounds like it was a success. And we just pray for a complete and full recovery for Ralph. Uh, no more heart issues for him. We pray that you would give him a sense of wisdom and, and your provision and your care and love for him. And we pray that he would feel our love for him, too, as he is in the hospital. Thank you, God, uh, for what you're doing uh, in and through Ralph for all of us. We live to you, Carol. Uh, that is a difficult situation that she finds herself in, in the wake of her husband's passing. And uh, so much is in flux. And her husband didn't take care of things like maybe he should have uh, during his life. Uh, we don't want to judge him or his memory. Uh, we just would like you to act on and in favor of Kara and bring some grace into her life and bring about a resolution of whatever situation needs to be resolved. Uh, God, motivate the people who uh, have the power in this situation that she does not have power in. Help motivate the people to act for her benefit, God, and for her, uh, for her in her 
best interest. Lord, thank you for Kara, and we pray that you be with her in this difficult and lonely and depressing situation. And we thank you for James being on the mend after his uh, bout, or at the end of his bout with COVID. And we thank you that there's been recovery, and that though he was pretty sick, uh, he is getting better. And we pray that his recovery would be complete. Uh, and that you would speed it along so that he can uh, return to the kind of life that he wants to live or work or whatever that he is looking forward to returning to, God. Thank you. And we continue to lift to you, Jody, and her entire family. Uh, God, we know how difficult the situation that can be. Many of us have been in similar situations, uh, and it can seem dark and even hopeless at times. We pray, God, that you would give hope where there seems like there is none that you would provide light where there seems like only darkness. That you would provide blessing and even joy, moments of joy. Even as suffering continues, that there would be moments of joy interspersed and that they would know, Jody and her entire family would know that those moments, those blessings come from you. Thank you, God, for all that you're doing uh, for her and for all of us as we come nearer and nearer to the day that we celebrate the birth of Christ and nativity. We pray, God, that you would help us to have that spirit in our heart of joy and of your of thanksgiving for your provision for us as a Savior. Thank you for the light and the joy of Christ and of Christmas. We lift to you all these prayers, God. There were so many of them, and we lift you to you, and we know that you're at work in each of these situations and all those lives, and in the ones that we didn't mention today, you're at work in those situations as well, and we pray that if you call us, you invite us to join in that work, we would say yes to your invitation. We lift it all to you in the name of Jesus, who taught us to pray today, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Our closing hymn this morning is number 242 in your hymnals. It's Love Came Down at Christmas. We are going to start with verses... One and two, I invite you to stand together as we say number two forty two. blessing. Go forth at this Christmas time and let love be your token. Love be yours and love be mine. Love to God and to all people. Love for plea and gift and son. Amen.